So I'm going to revisit last week's class and maybe add <coughs> some more detail that will perhaps enhance the purpose. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to go through Pashat Mishpatim and show how all the mitzvahs, one, new, all of them in order, have a sequence and a pattern. And last week, we stopped talking about momenists, we stopped talking about business and damages and relationships, financial relationships. We began to talk about what's called in Torah matters of Isur. Isur. Isur means things that are kosher and treif, where there's different rules. And what I proposed to you last week, and I'm going to repeat this proposal now, what I proposed to you last week, and this, I'm not making so this has the fetish in Chesid and Sfarim, that there are a lot of things in Yiddishkeit that are parallel. They're different parts of our life, but they're quite parallel, very, very similar. And as far as this conversation is concerned, there are three things that follow similar patterns. And this is what I was trying to propose to you last week. The three things are number one, business. That means our involvement with the Gashmi Yazdika world. Number two, Gili Aroyas. That means marital law, the laws of Tznias. And number three, Avedezare. Right? We have three big ones. Right? What are the three big ones? Avedezare, Gili Aroyas, and Shvi Chazdomim. You want to make finance at the Shvi Chazdomim, all you got to do is say the word jealousy. And when it comes to money, there's a lot of jealousy. So you can say that these patterns apply to all three things. Marital relations, exclusivity to Hashem, Avedezare versus Achas Hashem, and our interpersonal relationships that if we're not careful can bring to jealousy and jealousy can bring to anger and anger can bring to all kinds of terrible things. So I want to talk about each one separately. I'm not going to give you a long drush, I'll give you an akud. When it comes to matters of finance, I presented you with two thoughts. Number one, that if you are a member of a community, if you're a member of a community, there's a presumption of sharing. There's a presumption that when you live in a community, we're not stoned. It's not like America where you put up a fence, you have a neighbor for 25 years and you don't want us to know his name. There's an, a presumption of community. But on the other hand, there is such a thing called ownership. Ownership means Tere doesn't believe in collective, collectivization, in communism. I have my property and you have your property. So there's two aspects here. Aspect number one is everything has to be, before I use something, I make it mine. And I use it in a way that I'm, I'm happy to share it with you. I want you to know this is not a, a, a precise example, but it's, it's nevertheless an example. I heard from good sources if you gave money to the Rebbe stock, he didn't hold on to it. He put it in the bank right away. He put the money in the bank right away. If there was ever a situation, I was once involved in a dentata, where the whole controversy was that someone gave money to the Rebbe, and then another group of people were claiming that they wanted the money for themselves. So the Rebbe's people were screaming, he gave the money to the Rebbe. And the other Rebbe group was saying, that any time the Rebbe was given money, he immediately liquidated it. This was one case where the Rebbe was given money, a, a Yerusha, and instead of liquidating it, he left it. And they were arguing that the fact that he left it is that I had that the Rebbe didn't want to have it for himself. This is a long story, but this was a fact of life. If the Rebbe was given Zdokeh, he immediately made it his. And for Ket, you know, the beautiful thing was that they tell the stories that Shmuel Garadi was a very, very rich man. He was one of the biggest supporters of the Rebbe Rashab. I mean, the Rebbe Rashab had by him open checks. Anything the Rebbe needed, there was money for. He was a great soishir, but the Rebbe had a f- f- mamish. There was no such thing as a limit. The Rebbe Rashab once gave Shmuel Garadi a shlichus to do something for him. And the Rebbe opened up a drawer and he gave him money for the train, for the travel. So he said, Rebbe, I don't need the Rebbe's money for travel. And the Rebbe said, I'm not giving you the money because you don't have it. I'm giving you the money because I want the money to come for me. It's mine. You're doing a for me, the money comes from Gavoya, from me. So in finance, in, in business relationships, on the one hand there's a presumption, let's use a nice word, there's a, a presumption of a porousness, that means there's holes, we share, but at the same time there's ownership. Taylor doesn't believe in Hefkin, everything has to have an ownership. <coughs> and you, it becomes yours by making it yours, no God or you have to make a chazak and so on. The same is true in marital relations. That the Rambam brings that before Matan Tere there was a concept of marriage. 
But there was also a concept of no marriage. When the Abisha gave the Yidin the Torah, so first of all, he made new rules of marriage. And second of all, he made a rule. That if you want to have a relationship with a person, you have to marry them. It can't be Hefkir. And to use a nigla language, if you want to have a relationship with a woman, you have to give her a ring and make her yours and bring her into your own home and then you can have a relationship with her. Otherwise, it's called Oynes or Amafate. It, it, it's called seduction, Amafate. And I'm not going into the particulars was last week's class, but you have to give you the pay for it. It's, considered, it's not considered acceptable in Torah. And in some cases, it could be even Isalab. My point is, that when it comes to relation between men and women, it's not enough that she doesn't belong to somebody else. I have to make her mine. So there's two things here. Number one, it doesn't belong to somebody else. Taking from somebody else is a terrible avera. And number two, even if she doesn't belong to us, I have to make her my own. And the third example of the same is Avede Zodah. Now Avede Zodah is a bit tricky, and I'm, I'm making something up now. I've been making up things all year, so I'll make some, one more thing up to design. Right? Allah Avayda Zadah is you're married to God. We're all married to God. And the greatest of act, the worst Aved and Tayra, the only Aved and Tayra that doesn't have exceptions to the rules of Avayda Zadah. When you engage with worship of another God, it's disloyalty. It's Gilead Oyes. And you're the wife. We're not the husband. We're the wife. And when a wife is mezad with another husband, she's Chayiv Misa. <coughs> Correct? Now, let's refine this. Where would you have an example where it's not another husband, but it's still considered inappropriate because it's not your husband. And this is the concept of Tomim Tiyam Hashem Elekech. That Hashem gave Yidin another mitzvah. There's a mitzvah, Leisa say, you're not allowed to go to Avedah Zara. You're not allowed to go to, a, a, to Mechashif, which is Avedah Zara, as we discussed last week. You're not even allowed to go to a psychic, a koisim, and a menachish, which is only Isalav, it's not Avedah Zara. And it's Isalav. Why? Because Hashem gave us another thing. That in our relationship with Him, number one, we're not allowed to have a relationship with another God. And number two, we have to be sincere and loyal only to Him. That our relationship with Hashem is, as they say, at the wrong part of every single chuppah, to the exclusion of all others. They announce it by the Aedis. They should announce it by the Kedushim. To the exclusion of all others. So I gave you three models. Business, Marital relations and Aved Zara, and in all three, I'm pointing out that there's two things. Number one, it's not allowed to be somebody else's. And number two, I have to make it mine. This is true in, in, in finance. And if you understand the Ruchnias and you find Sadiqim, the Gemara says, Sadiqim, Mamoinam, Chavav Alev, Yetzim, Megufam, Sadiqim value their wealth more than their own bodies. There's a whole explanation for why. But the physical property of a tzaddik, even if it was not uh, for mitzvahs, the, the money that he had, he, he had a certain connectedness to it that made it very, very special. They made it his. And the same is true. Y you have to marry a woman if you want to have a relationship with a woman. And the same is true. Our relationship with Abish today is that, not, that we don't have any, even things which are not Aved Zara, if it's not direct, sincere to Akadosh Baruch, we never had those relationships. This is a review with some more structure, I guess, to what I said last week. Now we have four mitzvahs. I'm repeating last week's class. Four mitzvahs. And last week I was only able to break them up into two categories. And today I became more inventive. Four mitzvahs. All of them have to do with the same principle. We just spent a whole bunch of parshas, mishpatim, full of parshas, talking about finance, about business. And the question of what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. And if I damage you and if you damage me. The relationships between people. And you move on to that to Nyana Isur. And when it comes to Nyana Isur, the, we had last week four steps. The first is Mafate. She's not married to anybody else. But I don't want to marry her. I don't want to make her my own. The second is Machashefe, which is Kishif, which is a form of a Vedizara. The third is a roiva and a nira, but that means, this is so disgusting, bestiality, I think they're called, living with an animal. And the fourth is a veich lo lekim yecharam, again, a veidezara. And last week, I presented it to you in two steps. The sin of mafat is, I'm not doing anything wrong. But I'm not doing something right. I want a relationship with a woman, I have to marry her, I have to make her mine. 
I don't want to do that, so it's considered an Aveda. I have to pay. Mechashef is Aveda Zod. Aveda Zod, not only I'm not doing something right, I'm doing something wrong, I'm going to another God. It's, it's a skila. And I, I couldn't get past those two basic ideas. So I'm starting over, and I, I came up with four steps. And again, this is drush. Drush means it's pshetl. It's not pshat, it's pshetl. <laughs> pshat with alam. It's just interesting, and I'm trying to do something which I'm not qualified to do. To show the sequence of all the halachas, the pashat, the we've gotten pretty far. So what's the dinam of fata? The dinam of fata is that if I have a relationship with somebody, and there's nothing wrong with the relationship, <coughs> But I'm not miyachta la'atzmi, I'm not making her mine. It's not allowed, it's an aved. But when I have a relationship with somebody else, it's not enough that she does somebody belong to somebody else, I have to make her mine. There's two separate things. She does not allowed to belong to anybody else, there'll be a very big aveda, and I have to make her mine. Everything has to be private, everything has to have rishuyas. The way the Abish created the world, we don't share. That's how Taylor works. We're not, we don't believe, like I said, in collectivization, in communism, there's private ownership. And this is not just a financial thing, it's a spiritual thing. There's privacy. You want to have a relationship with a woman, you have to marry her. Go ahead. Didn't you say the father's a narrow? Yeah. So that's not a problem itself? Other than the fact... She's not a murasa. What's murasa? Married. Then it's a it's a stealer. She's a pnuya, the psula. Right, she's a narrow. that's not a problem in Allah at all. In Allah it's not a problem, no. And the second is Kishif. Kishif is a form of sorcery, it's a form of magic. But like I told you last week, some forms of magic are only in Isalav. Meaning to say they're not Avay Dezara, they're just not Tomi Mahasham Alakacha. Kishif is Isa Skila, Machashef Alay Zakai, Machashef gets Skila. Which means this particular form of magic, this particular form of psychic power, is Kekit Avay Dezara. So if we're going to uh, see this in gradations, if we're going to see this in steps, so the first step is, I'm involving myself in a relationship where I'm not doing anything wrong, but I'm not making her mine. The second step is, not only am I not relating to my own God, I'm relating to somebody else's God. Right? So it's, it's much worse. What could be worse than that? The person who's married in a relationship with somebody else, what could be worse than that? So the third example is a reva nanirba, having a relationship with an animal. So I want to share with you an insight Having a relationship with an animal is a sickness. It's, a, it's not even a type. It's sick. It's disgusting. So I want to tell you something very important. We're going to put him, right? We're going to put him. The Rebbe had a constant theme when it came to put him. The same message every put him, but he, each time he obviously presented using different psukim, different gemaras. The Rebbe's yada is believable, so the Rebbe's presentations are believable, but there was an underlying theme about Purim, which weaves itself through all the Rebbe's Teda. The story of Purim is Yidin trying to be like Goyim. And eventually reaching a point where they talk a think they've been accepted. And then overnight they send them into the gas chambers. This has happened again and again in our history. This happened in Germany, right? This is the story of the Nazis. The German Jews wanted one thing. Isn't it, it's so poetic, it's terribly poetic, terribly poetic justice. The Jews of Germany created the reform movement based on the idea that if they're going to be German enough, they're not going to be hated. That was the whole sheet of the reform. In the street you're a German, in your house you're a Jew, in the street you're a German, don't draw attention to yourself, you're not going to have anti-Semitism, and they tried so hard. The average German Jew would tell you, I'm a German first and a Jew second. And they went into the gas chambers together with the Ust Yudin, with the Jews with the torn kapotas that had dust on them. And long disheveled beards. Jews sometimes think, feel that the greatest thing that can happen to themselves is that they should assimilate with Goyim and Goyim should accept them. One of the most important circumstances in our history where that happened was in Golos Bovel. What was Golos Bovo? It's such a fascinating story. It's such a fascinating. I tell it a lot because people don't know it, even though you know it, but you don't know that you know it. Nebuchadnezzar Bo- Harashi was a bad man. He was a, a caliph, a dog, an, an animal. He was an incredibly 
bestial human being. He was a really evil man. Um, and the Ruchadetz destroyed the base Hamikdash. And as always happens, part of the reason he destroyed the base Hamikdash was because of our stupid political decisions. Underneath it all, we didn't listen to the Navi. Yirmiya said, "Don't fight with Bavel." And the Yidden said, no, no, we're going to go with Bavel's enemy. They went to Mitzrayim and it brought on Tzadus on Ashir. It culminated in the death of Gedalia and Achikam and so on. But Nebuchadnezzar wasn't a fool. He wasn't a fool. He came to Jerusalem twice. He came under Yechonia and didn't destroy the base of Mikdash. He took Yechonia into exile, left the base of Mikdash standing, took in his place, um, whatever it is, to Kiyahu. And then he came back many years later and destroyed the base of Mikdash. When he came the first time, he plundered Jerusalem. He took all of his Jewish wealth. He took the gold, he took the silver, he took the precious stones. And he took the most important resource the Jewish people had. Their technology. What was that? Does anybody know what that was? He took the Jewish mines. The Kabbalah. In the time of the first base, Amikdash, imagine Jews living in one place for a thousand years. What kind of a civilization they're going to build? In the ancient world, the Hebrews were heaven and about everybody else. They were just smarter. They built an incredible kingdom. Unbelievable. And the whole world respected Jewish intelligence. So this Rosh Hashanah and Rosh came to the Shalayim, took the smartest Jews, didn't put them in chains, he put them in his cabinet. He gave them the most powerful positions in the country. He said, help me run my country. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of being a king forever. That's the whole story with the Tzalem of Nebuchadnezzar. And he appointed Daniel, Hananiah, Mishal. He divided up his kingdom into four, gave each one a quarter. He wanted Jews to run his government and to believe that that's the best thing he could do for himself. When Yidin came to Bavel the first time, and even the second time, what was the attitude of their captors, the Babylonian Goyim? who were a very powerful nation at that time. What was their relationship with the Jewish people that came to Bavel? This was these, these were the smartest people in the world. <coughs> they were not treated like common prisoners. Everybody wanted a, a Jew in his business for financial reasons. In other words, Yidin came into Bavel after being killed and brutalized and all the rest. But in Bavel, I'm thinking, Mach, good, the hope goes Bavel in 70 years. And during those 70 years, you have to have Bavel. <laughs> and then you have to have Modai. And then you have to upon us. It happens very fast, right? There's many, many kingdoms happening very quickly. But Yidin and Bavel lived incredibly well. Because the Goyim respected Yidin. And what was the consequence of that? You read in the book of Ezra. What was the consequence of that? It's hard to understand, but true. You're talking about Yehudina, not Yisrael. The, 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 you know, the religious Jews, you know, the Haredim, the, I don't know what you want to call them, the Haimis. It was an incredible rate of assimilation. Ezra Sefer describes that he's going back, he's going back at the soul to build the second base of Mikdash. So the best Jews, he left in Babel. The best Jews, the most miyuchas that he didn't, he didn't take with him. He left them in Babel. Kol Arotz, Isel, Etzol, Etzol, Isel, the Babel. He took the problems. Why? Because he said, he'll figure it out. He'll use Rocha Kodesh, he'll clean them up. In Chutz Lars, he left the miyuchasim. The kosher Jews, you know who his father was, you know who his mother was, and there was a good thing. On the way back to Yisrael, he stops and he starts asking questions and he begins to realize how many is Goyim is schlepping. The assimilation was terrible. And Ezra has a meltdown. He, he describes that how upset he gets. He says, I'm not moving from this place till we clean this up. And on the way back to Yisrael, they stop. Nobody had to bring the Shtar Yuchsid. It was a whole situation. So Yidin and Golis Bavel were treated fairly, kindly. What was the Jews' reaction? The guy likes me. We're friends. We're, we're, we're the same. The same disease that the Yidin had in America and the same disease Yidin had in Germany. The Purim story is the precursor for that idea, the guy accepts me. All I want is to be accepted by the guy. And they were living wonderfully well materially. They were members of high society. They married into the upper crust of the political spectrum. And then overnight, overnight, bin Lail, Haman is killing every one of them. Every one of them, man, woman, and child. 
And in all the Rebbe's Fabreng and Zapurim, the Rebbe tells this story. And he says, when a Yid tries to act like a Goy, the Goy reminds him that he's different. Yesh na'am echad, the Jewish people are different. Not we're different because we have different mitzvahs, not we're different because we have a different skin color, not we're different because we speak a different language. We're different because God made us different by etzem. A Yid and a Goy don't mix like water and kerosene, water and, and oil. And every time Yidin thought to assimilate, the guy reminded them. Their so-called friendly neighbor turned on them and reminded them, you're not one of us, you're a Yid. You're a Yivrei. You're a stranger. You're an alien. I don't like you. And the Rebbe says, every time Yidin tried to assimilate, Goyim reminded them. So the Rebbe says, let's stop trying to assimilate. Let's be proud. He says, the Rebbe put a message year after year after year. Every time we think that it will be goyish enough, the goy is going to say we're just like him. The guy reminds us that we're different. So let's be proud of who we are. This is a universal message of the Rebbe Ampurim. I think without an exception. But there's another aspect to it. And the other aspect to it, this is also tragic, the part of our history is, when <coughs> Jews try to assimilate, when Jews try to get the goy to like them, they out goy the goy. You understand? If I want the guy to think that me and him are the same. But I know I'm not. And deep, 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 deep down, I know that he knows I'm not. So I overcompensate. I try very, very hard to be a good guy. We had once had a political officer, I'm not going to say in what field, who used to take five showers a day. Five showers a day. That's, that's OCD. That's messed up. Why? Why? A person thinks that their dirt is unwashable, offable. <laughs> unwashable. <laughs> However, you would say that. You wash and you wash and you wash. What's this? When Yidin try to act like Goyim, they outgoy the Goy. And there's a posse for this in Pashas Hazinu. Pashas Hazinu is the story of Jewish history in a nutshell, in a very, very, very deep, and dense, and concentrated nutshell. We Yidna do incredibly well, and Abish that embraces them, and Abish that loves them, and then we get fat. And we get overconfident. And we turn on God. And we do all kinds of things which, rebel, which make us, which, which is our act of rebellion against Abish And again, to use the language of this conversation, we say we're not different than the Goy, we're exactly the same as the Goy, and we're going to prove it. So the Pasuk says, the Pasuk says, <laughs> the meaning of these words literally is <laughs> new people came from near <laughs> your fathers never imagined this so Rashi says that when Yidin turned to Avayda Zara when Yidin turned to Avayda Zara they make such retarded Avayda Zara that the guy walks by and says Zu Avayda Zara Yehudis a Jew made this when a Yid tries to be a Goy, he outgoes the Goy, and the Goy says, only a Jew would have thought of this. This? <laughs> we, we're pagan. Right? We're not loyal to our husband. HaKadosh Baruch. We have other gods. But it's say the Masudin. When a Yid is trying to be accepted by the non-Jew, by being like him, in accepting Avayda Zara, he creates idols that the Goy would never think of. Farvos. Because he knows in his heart that there's no way he's going to be like the Goy. The Goy is never going to see him as the same as he is. So he overcompensates. And I'm proposing that's the third step. Reva Nirva. If Mefateh, the first step is, I'm having a relationship, I'm not doing anything wrong, but I don't want to be Miyachtala Atma, I don't want to make him mine. That's the first negative step. The second step is classic of Edezot, I'm having a relationship with another God. The third step is I'm creating an unnatural God. Not only is it another God, it's not even in Teva. So what I'm proposing to you, what my idea is, that these four steps, Mefateh, Mechashefa, Roi Vanirve, and Zaveach Lovakim Yocharam, Bilt Lavad Lavad, I'll get to it in a moment, they're actually four steps that re re revolve around the same principle. We are supposed to have relationships. Those relationships are supposed to be proper. So first of all, does the relationship is what I, what I have a relationship with, I have to make mine. Second of all, my relationship is not allowed to be yours. Third of all, in me trying to pursue what is yours, I can become so 
perverse, so crazy that I'll create a form of a relationship with another God, which, is, which the guy says only a Jew would think it is. And I'm suggesting that having a relationship with an animal is not, it's not Gilearoyes, it's disgusting. It's, it's not, it's not, it's garnished, it's nothing. So if, if, my, if, my, if, my, if my suggestion is correct, you have three steps, right? Mafata means I'm not doing anything wrong, but I'm not, making, I'm not doing something right. If I desire me, they're doing something wrong, but I'm doing something wrong, which is in the parameter of normal. And Rei Vanir, they're doing something wrong, which is, which, is, which, is, which is crazy, which is abnormal. So what could be worse than that? <laughs> what could be worse than that? So forcing is Zoveach lo lekim yacharam, bitl lasham levadeh. So I have two thoughts, and this is really me. <coughs> like I said, I'm, this is drush, this is entire, this is drush, this is pshatl. Okay, I have, I have an obsession with the word chenem, ches reish mem. When I say I have an obsession with the word chenem, I'm trying to find an opportunity to give a class on the word chenem. Problem is, I never feel prepared because it's incredibly complicated. The word chenem is used to describe a neder. One of the words that's used for a neder is chenem. I take from its mind and I'm machlemit to the evishter, I'm machlemit to the koyenem. Machlem means I give it away to Hashem. The word chedem is also used to describe a person who has been, uh, what's the word? Sentenced to death. A person who, who did a crime. The punishment of that crime is death. And the sentence has been passed. He's called chedem. That person is called chedem. And then of course you have the story in Tanakh with uh, Ochon, that Chedem means we're not going to have any benefit from it, we're not going to use it at all. So the word Chedem is used in Chedem in many different circumstances, many different ways. I have a curiosity about this word because I, I'm a strong believer that words in Chedem, words in Chedem are creations. Words are not just words, they're creations, they represent things. And in my understanding, the word Chedem means that something is such a bad thing that even while it exists, it doesn't exist already. Now, what does the Pasuk say in Pashas B'chuk I looked it up. That if a person was sentenced to death, and then he says, I'm giving tzedakah against my own worth, erki a lie. He doesn't have to pay a penny. Or somebody else will say, erki plenty a lie. A person has committed a crime, and he's been tried, and he's been found guilty, and he's been convicted and sentenced to death. If somebody says, I'm going to give money against that person's value, the answer is the O zero. That person doesn't exist. He has no value. But the word that's used to denote a man who is sentenced to death has no value as the word chedem. We need to say that even when a person is being sentenced to death, there's different words that would denote a person who's sentenced to death. What does the word chedem mean? He doesn't exist anymore. He's still here, but he doesn't exist. Because of the sentence, it's as if he's not here. This pasuk, the fourth category, after Mafata and after Machashefa and after Reva Nirva, is a Vedazara, but the last pasuk is Zoiveach Lo, where the comments. Zoiveach Lo Elohim Yocharom. Bilti Levai Levadi. We're talking about a Jew who's done a Vedazara that Taylor describes that his punishment is Chedim. Now, in Halacha, what I'm about to say has no weight. It doesn't hold any weight. But in Drush, you can say whatever you want. Here's what I'm saying. What are the rules of a Vedazara? What are the rules of a Vedazara? Right, there's 49 lavim, 49 lavim of Rav 49 lavim, that's more than 5% of the, of, of the mitzvah that lays out says 1 out of 7. 49 lavim connected to Rav 49 isurim connected to Rav Why? There's a whole bunch of types of Rav There's a rule about Rav There's an Rav which is called Markulis. Markulis means you walk by a, a, an arrangement of a couple of stones and you throw a rock on it. It's called Markulis. There's an Avedizara which is called Pa'ir, where you do something else. There's an Avedizara which is called Moilech, um, which is something else. If you were to worship Markulis using the technique of Pa'ir or, or, or Moilech, you're not guilty. Each Avedizara has to have its own worship. You're Chayef for worshiping Avedizara only if you did the Avedizara which is. Avoid the zara specific to that avoid the zara. You understand? I'm a zayek of Malkulis. If I throw a stone at Malkulis 
And I think, and I'm doing it to shame the Barkulis. I don't know that this is a Barkulis. I throw a stone to shame it. I'm Chayef. I, I may be considered Oynes, Allah has been called Mechatas. But if I throw a stone to a Moilech, or to some other, it's nothing. I embarrassed it. You understand? Every Avodah Zara has to be worshipped in the Avodah Zara specific way. There's four exceptions. There are four things, no matter what Avodah Zara it is, if I use one of these for exercises, I'm Chayav Misa. And those four things are the four things that apply in the base of Mikdash. Meaning not only am I worshipping an idol, I am worshipping an idol the way I worship God. That's how Rashi translates the words, Zeveach lo lekim yochram, built in Hashem levadeh, there's many Avay Dezadahs. Every Avay Dezadah is specific. You worship the Avay Dezadah in its way. Except four things. If you shecht to any Avay Dezadah, Zeveach means to shecht to slaughter. If you sprinkle blood, right, Zvicha, Shechita and Helacha and Zika and Akhtara. I slaughter and I, coll- and I bring and I sprinkle and I sacrifice. I, I, I think I'm telling you the right four, but I may be wrong. These four things are universal. No matter what Ravai Dezada it is, even if there's a Ravai Dezada which says you're not allowed, to sh- not allowed to take a life, if I shechted an animal to that Ravai Dezada, I'm Chayav Misa. Why? Because I'm worshipping the Ravai Dezada the way I worship my God. So the Apostlech says, Zaveich wa lakim yochram. There's many other desires. But if you bring God's worship, that's how, that's how I'm spinning this, okay? This is not aloha, this is drush. And it's pathetic drush. It's my drush. It's drush in 21st century. If, if, if you take a worship which is done in the base of Mikdash and present it to an Avay Dezara, Yacharam, you, you're already dead. You don't exist anymore. And I'm proposing that this is the fourth level. So what I'm trying to do at Abaisai is proposed that these four things, Mafata, Mechashefa, Reva Nirba, and then are taking four steps. In Mafata, I'm not doing anything wrong, I'm making her my own. In Mechashefa, I'm doing something wrong because it's somebody else's. In Reva Nirba, I'm creating a freakish, I'm creating an, another husband to have a relationship with which God wouldn't think of. And the fourth one, I'm taking the worship of God into that house of worship. And the, such a person is in a state of Chedem. Chedem means... He has to be put to death for his crime. And his status is such that he already is not the Messiah. So to be honest, I didn't teach you anything new. I just went over last week's class. And I satisfied my ego. <laughs> that I showed how these four steps. And we'll continue, I hopefully conclude next week. I mean, I'm finishing now. Okay, Maidev. Thank you.